Welcome to Travel Zoom. Can I just ask you to briefly tell us your name and what you do? Sure. I'm Wendy Gilmartin. Uh, I'm an architect and I'm the owner of Wendy Gilmartin Architecture. We make buildings in Los Angeles and in the Mojave Desert. And um, I'm also a writer and I teach architecture at Cal State Polytechnic University in Pomona. Thanks. And can I, can you briefly describe Los Angeles to somebody who might not be familiar with the city? It's the densest urbanized area in the country, and it's the least affordable. It's dry, sprawling, full of latent potential, and it's always having a constant makeover. Everyone has a swimming pool, everyone has a car, and everyone knows a movie star. <laughs> Love it. Some of that is true and some of that is not, <laughs> but that's quintessential to the city. So, so let's dig into it a little bit more. And I'd love you to talk a little bit in general about LA's urban planning. So what's, what stands out is compared to other dense cities like New York, Tokyo even, with a lot of population, what stands out is the high number of single home uh, family homes in, in LA. So can you talk a little bit about how it came about that city started spreading out so much rather than developing? Sure. There are many compounding reasons for the identity of Los Angeles, uh, like all cities. Um, um, a few of those reasons are the auto industry um, back in the 40s and 50s, essentially eliminating all public transportation options in the city while at the same time building freeways and promoting car culture. And so that culture fed into a slow growth movement out in the suburbs, um, the not in my backyard movement, NIMBY is the acronym for that. Some of your listeners probably are familiar with that and homeowners resisting making any taller, denser buildings in their neighborhoods. Um, and so, we also have an antiquated zoning law in LA. Um, it's very inflexible. Um, but I think probably most importantly, the founding of the city on the economy of land speculation. Um, just to expand on that a little bit, I think, I think LA is perceived as kind of a free-spirited, um, hippie culture from the 60s, left-leaning kind of atmosphere that we have out here. And historically, that's not true. Um, so unlike other cities where, um, it developed because of trade, because they were on a port or near a river, um, or like in a city in Texas that is, um, founded on resource extraction, like oil, um, LA actually was founded on a handful of white, rich men, <laughs> um, buying up large pieces of land and cutting them up and selling them off. So land speculation in terms of real estate development, selling those pieces of land as single family homes. And, and, um, and so I'm, and literally there was like a handful, there's like five or six of these guys. And then a couple others who owned newspapers who helped advertise that land and the warm weather, and they kind of served as the marketing arm of the scheme. Um, and so that was the economic, Chandler's were one of those. Yeah, Chandler's were one. Um, they owned the Los Angeles Times. Um, the Huntington's were one. Um, Abbott Kinney was one. Um, and, uh, and so that power structure the financial power and the journalistic power was also eventually the governing structure of the city. And it also was the structure, it also headed up the structure of the Los Angeles Police Department. So really from the top down um, was, is, is really a right wing, white, racist, frankly, um, power structure that was, was built to make money for a, a handful of wealthy families. So what's that new approach and, you know, when has it started reversing if it has and, you know, what's, what's next for LA? Sure. Sure. So it, so it's going to be a combination of things. Um, we have a different sort of approach now we, that are, you know, our 
building blocks are on that system that I just described, but um, we are more woke. I guess I'm using air quotes with my fingers. <laughs> um, we are more woke city uh, than I just described. Um, so, so it will take a combination of things, and I and I believe that that will happen. I think people are really. Um, um, people really know, the, the citizens of LA and the residents of LA know that this has to change and we have to um, fix our housing crisis. So on a small scale, there'll be density added to single family house lots. And those buildings are called ADUs, accessory dwelling units. And it's basically building a little house in your backyard. So the idea is to double the single family home number. Um, and then all the way to the other end of the spectrum is building tall housing towers along the large corridors where public transit already is in the city, and then developing mid-level um, housing in between. So it'll be all that. And homeless housing has to be built. All levels of low to middle income to market rate housing have to be built. Live work housing has to be built because um, makers and freelancers um, don't have a kind of housing product to accommodate them anymore. They used to in downtown LA with the lofts that were in downtown LA, but now the housing prices have gone up in downtown and those lofts sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars in some cases. So all of this needs to be acknowledged. And I, and I think that it can, but I think also Part of this is that the city needs to acknowledge its racial sins are really tied to land speculation and um, in terms of how freeways were built to cut through black neighborhoods and redlining potential Asian, brown and black homeowners out of home ownership. That, that's all real, that happened in other cities too, but that really happened in LA too. And it needs to be resolved finally because um, communities of color are moving out of LA and all these things that we love about these neighborhoods and subcultures and cuisines and art and everything are gonna go away if we don't rectify that. Wow, yeah, it sounds like great needs for your skills and, and other architects, a lot of work to do. Wendy, so you mentioned in your previous answer, you mentioned briefly about Kinney, and I did want to ask you about Venice, one neighborhood in LA, which like in many cities, there are neighborhoods that go through transformation and I think different phases. So, you know, I, I was um, specifically interested in this neighborhood because that kind of started with a very surreal vision of Abbot Kinney, then kind of went through this artistic enclave and then period of decay because of number of disasters <laughs> because of his vision and, and kind of right now it's a very very expensive upscale area so can you just maybe briefly talk about it sure yeah so abbot kinney's um one of these guys that i mentioned <laughs> um, not to be so casual about it but um ironically someone who left um an east coast city uh because so many jews and southern europeans and immigrants were moving there to get to this new promised land in LA only to build a fake Venice <laughs> um, in LA. So so that's ironic. But um, Abakini, I think, I, I'm not a huge like Venice historian, but Abakini was a tobacco mogul. Uh, and he, like a lot of these land developers, um, integrated a kind of spectacle into the new um, housing project. So like, for example, Henry Huntington, um, who I, the Huntingtons I mentioned before is over in Pasadena where, where I am, was one of the founders, developers out here, built like a, a hillside funicular train um, to draw attention, uh, kind of feature to, um, Ha, uh, to to provide a kind of spectacle uh, that might be interesting to live near. Um, so so these developments um, sort of had these kind of quirky, uh, almost amusement park uh, type um, elements to them. And I think that Venice is a perfect example of that because that's what Abakini did. And I think there were even like 
gondola drivers at some point, um, and that was the early 1900s. But the, by the 50s and 60s, uh, it, it wasn't um, Venice with a pit. And, and, um, and uh, it was like, you know, when I was a kid, my parents were like, don't go to Venice. Please don't go to Venice. It's a bad, it's a bad place. Um, because it was a place where um, uh, a lot of like wayward youth had moved there, hippies had moved there, like the doors, that's where the doors, you know, met and started playing music. And there were coffee houses and the Soul Kitchen. Soul Kitchen's like one of their songs. And that's a place that was in Venice. And, but it was a place where, um, all these different types of creators could go and could live because it was affordable <laughs> and there was a kind of conviviality there and a kind of movement came out. I mean, the big uh, avant-garde um, movement in design and architecture came out of there in the 70s and 80s with Frank Gehry and um, Tom Main and Eric Moss and Coy Howard and all these people because they could, they could work out of these like ramshackly warehouses and and um, and beach shacks, you know, and so and so when I lived in Venice like ten years ago, it was right when there was a bit of that still, but it was right when tech was moving in. A lot of tech companies were moving in, and at the same time, a lot of wealthy people were buying up single family homes and and trans transitioning them, I guess, to Airbnbs. So there was this influx of wealthy tech people, which isn't necessarily such a bad thing, but the Airbnb thing kind of made for a transitional, like it, almost a tourist population, like a um, transitional population of people who aren't there all the time. So I think that the possibility of the, these art movements and avant-garde movements or new, new music um, uh, m movements or cultural movements happening um, is hindered by the lack of affordable space um, in places like that. Because, you know, the next um, big art thing in LA isn't going to come out of Venice because you can't really create a movement from a collection of Airbnb renters, right? No, you can't. Where are the, where are the artists going right now? Is there an area where perhaps the next Venice? <laughs> mm, I mean, I think it's going to, be at the edge of the city. I think it's, you know, a lot of people are moving out to the desert. A lot of people are moving out to the Inland Empire. Um, the next movement might come from, might come from the homeless encampments, might come from Skid Row. Um, because you need, uh, people who create need a kind of infrastructure of affordability and space. Right? Yeah, 100%. So Wendy, you contributed an essay to a collection of essays under title Latitudes and Angelinos Atlas, which I actually really, really like that title. I think it's a very, very smart title. So your essay is called Ugly Buildings. Can you explain the title and tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So the Angelinos Atlas uh, that came out in 2015, although it's it's not a new book, but it held up very well. And the each there's nine chapters, and each chapter is written by a different LA writer. And my chapter is on ugly buildings, and that uh, chapter looks at the potentials that are overlooked in the city, like we were just talking about, um, in the valleys or in the outlying areas. Uh, there's just miles and miles of strip malls and parking structures and tract homes and ugly office buildings and um a lot of la is ugly typically not everything in la is the kind of uh beautiful frank lloyd wright house or the beautiful mid-century modern house or the storybook spanish style architecture that we see in the film noir in the 30s and 40s right so a lot of it is uh working class or older or tarnished um but i i find the ugliness endearing because I think there's like a kind of freedom in it. I think there's like this a potential in it. Say, I tell my architecture students about Paris. Uh, everyone loves Paris. Paris is lovely. It's beautiful. We've both been there and probably it's one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I would agree with that. And it's got the large boulevards and the radial streets that point towards these monuments and 
the buildings on either side of the street are uniformly aesthetic, you know, of a uniform aesthetic. And there's anywhere you are, there's a park in walking distance. That's on, that only is like that because there was a dictator <laughs> who ruled with an iron fist and anointed Baron Hausmann, um, the city architect, to clear, to, to like violently clear um, people out of their homes to make all those parks and to make the boulevards bigger. And so, so um, the reason why Paris looks that way is because there was like, a, it was it was a dictator uh, um, decreed it, you know. The ugliness of LA is just sort of slapdash and anybody can do it. And I'm gonna put this weird paint on my house and, so that's what I mean about freedom. Of, of, there's a freedom to it. There's a kind of um, there's a kind of exuberance and messiness to it that I think is um, is is like the opposite of Paris because there's no, because there's a lot of um, freedom for expression or individual expression. Yeah, great point. I think LA is probably one of the most misunderstood cities, right? When people arrive and kind of expect something beautiful, and then there's just a mass massive sprawl that you can't take in easily. So I'd love to take this opportunity since I have you here to hear about a few of your hidden architectural gems that, you know, probably deserve attention, but don't get it. Yeah. So, so I think that those strip malls I was talking about, um, those are a hidden gem. We're actually working on a book right now in my office on, um, what's the next thing that's going to move into the strip mall, uh, the retail center after retail goes away with retail is almost gone now from you know, post COVID um, and hopefully how, how to kind of readapt those spaces for housing, live work, farming, common spaces, public spaces. That's kind of what we're working on now. Um, Frank Gehry has a great retail center in Santa Monica. It's an old, old, old project from like the seventies or eighties. It's called Edgemar. And um, I think there's a Pete's coffee in there now, but anyone can go check that out. It's on main street in Santa Monica. One of my favorite Frank Gehry projects um, Union Station is downtown. Uh, it's lovely. It's beautiful. It's a fun place to go if you're an out of towner to see if you can identify the movies and TV shows that have been shot there. Um, the Pavilion for Japanese Art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art by Bruce Goff and Bart Prince is lovely. The light quality in there is lovely, and the way that you circulate through the building is very nice. Um, Simon Rodia's Watts Towers are an absolute treasure. We're so lucky to have them. If they're still there and that they're upkept so well. Um, if there's a chance for your listeners to go to Watts, that's a great place to stop. Um, any of the Frank Lloyd Wright houses you can get into are great. Any of the Rudolf Schindler houses that you can get into are great. Um, I think it's also what I always point out to visitors is try to find vantage points. Um, our topography is such a hilly and vast hills and valleys all over LA. And it's, there are lots of really nice places to catch the whole view of certain areas of the city. Um, one of my favorites is, um, Vista Hermosa Park, which is just west of downtown. It has a really expansive view. Uh, you can just see the lay of the land of downtown in LA and the Baldwin Hills scenic overlook, uh, is right on the border of. Baldwin Hills and Culver City, and you get like a 360 view of the whole city from up there. Wow, some fantastic gems to check out there. Thanks so much, Wendy. When is the book out? Ho hopefully next year. Uh, uh, all the best with that. Great, so you're working on a book, you're involved in massive projects. Anything else exciting you're currently working on that you can share? Uh, yeah, actually we're wrapping up a project um, that will be in the book. Uh, that's a healthcare facility that is in a former clothing store. So that's um, a new healthcare uh, facility that's coming in where retail used to be. Um, and out in the desert, we're working on a bar and restaurant out near Joshua Tree and a writer's retreat center, which we've been working on for quite a while out there. Back in LA, um, we're working on uh, 
a lot of ADUs, so those smaller homes, which I mentioned, um, LA City is allowing folks to build in their rear yards. So we've got a bunch of those and some hillside work we've been recommended for that. So we have a bit of a specialty um, in hillside work. So if any of your listeners want to look at any of that or check out any of our work, we've got a website at wendygilmartin.com and we're also on Instagram at wendy.gilmartin.architecture. Wendy, that's been a sheer delight. Uh, it's been great to have you on. Thanks so much and uh, all the very, very best with your projects with the book and we'll watch that space. <laughs> Thanks so much, Aga.